no life should just be forgotten. Especially during what was thought to be the war to end all wars. America is free. We want the world to be free. Understand that these just aren't names, that these were human beings. These were family members. These were people that worked in the general store. The members are not growing thinner, but stronger as time passed. Everybody put a lot on the line. And I'm really hoping that Paul will be the catalyst for people to say, let's look more into our history in this. I think Paul was very proud to wear the American uniform and even prouder to serve his country. You know, they call World War II our greatest generation and, and they are our greatest generation. But before them, there was another great generation. There were a heck of a lot of young men in this country who knew really nothing going on in the world. Their world was their little community they lived in and just gave up everything they had in their lives to put on a uniform and go help countries that they had never imagined visiting, much less going to and fighting and dying for, for people that were just like them, just spoke a different language. Dear brother, we little know what is before us in this world, and it probably is best we don't. We are all trusting in God, hoping that everything will come out all right, if it be his will. Remaining your loving brother, Private Paul Maynard, Company M, 102nd Infantry. Three thousand miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Everything you hold worthwhile is at stake. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. Invoking the spirit of our forefathers, the Army asks your unflinching support to the end that the high ideals for which America stands may endure upon the earth. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there. Send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. The drums run coming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer. Send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over. And we won't come back till it's over, over there. The Muse Are Gone campaign would lead to the end of the, the First World War, not solely by itself, but in conjunction with the Allies. This is one of America's most significant and largest, most costly battles. It was fought over 47 days. Over 26,000 lost. The wounded in the hundreds of thousands. The American effort overall, we did not come in and win this war. We contributed to its end. I like to tell the French, because of the French's perspective of the First World War, I like to tell the French that we all we did was we 
we uh, tilted the balance. And that's what we truly did. Without the Americans, what would have happened? Let the historians uh, speculate, but it would have been a harder go. There's no two ways about that. The significance overall of the Meuse-Argonne campaign was this was the first time that America would really show its power and its might. This was an essential battle to the conclusion of the war, and it was started by the Americans in support of the entire Allied offensive that would go from basically from the Verdun area all the way up into Belgium. Dear brother, we cannot help but see that the end is getting near all the while. I am still trying to dodge the shells, and if I keep on having good luck, I guess we'll see each other before a great while. Your loving brother, Paul. They've been fighting the Muzar Gan campaign since the end of September, and it was pretty much a, a long, slow, bloody grind. On the 27th, the M Company, where Paul was assigned, really got into the probably some of the most bloody combat they would ever see to that time and, and probably ever since. I say that because of the decimation that happened to M Company, which is a company that ordinarily would have around 200 men. And I don't know what the strength was prior to going in there, but they would come out of that battle with uh, 34 men. That's a, that's a significant amount of loss. As far as I can ascertain, what he was doing then was really a lot of heavy fighting, almost nonstop. The, the shellings that they endured being in the trenches. You, you didn't have anything like that in any other war. Cook 360 is where uh, M Company took their losses. It's an absolutely incredible area to visit. I've not seen too many areas like that. They came into this area that was well fortified expecting to be able to take the hill and hold it and move forward as was the desire of the division. But approximately 10,000 rounds of enemy ammunition and artillery fell on that hillside where they were in the matter of two hours. That's an incredible amount of ammunition in one area. Those hills would have been decimated, no trees. You see trees growing there today, but the trees would have been pretty much taken down. It would have been a shattered hilltop. We can see the craters from the, from the artillery are still quite profuse, filled with water nowadays. Paul referenced in his letters, you didn't hear the bombs dropping until they were almost on you. It was literally just suddenly you heard a whistling sound, a little motor, and boom. You know how terrifying that must have been for them. I mean, most of these soldiers had never even seen a car. And Suddenly, they're dodging bombs being f thrown at them from the air. Paul's unit would move down to uh, Samogenu, realizing that it had been pretty much decimated. The division would try to recover what they had. It would, they'd moved into basically what was a they considered a, a quiet area, although it was only three kilometers from where they had absolutely lo had lost a, an incredible amount of life. I had read once at the, at the National Archives in one of the official documents that Paul had been moved back away from the front line. And that made me happy. I thought, okay, good, he had a break from it, but 
then additional documents showed what that meant, he had been moved from the first trench just back to the third trench. So he was still experiencing the shelling and the, the bombs from the planes. Dear brother, I have thought a good many times recently that I never would be able to write home again. We've had a hard time at this front and will be glad when it's over with. Don't forget your old chum. Love from Paul. From the 8th of November, we have the division pushing forward and then establishing a line on the 9th of November. At this point, we're breaking out of the woods to an overlook of the plain to the east towards Metz. The armistice was being talked about, but yet men had to go into battle. The 26 did. They would find themselves next to the Ville de Chaumont, or Ville devant Chaumont, which means the village in front of uh, Chaumont, and uh, on the open exposed uh, terrain there. The uh, application of machine guns and, and direct observation was clear. Artillery was very precise, very dangerous, as well as the machine guns, absolutely devastating. The Germans had four years to prepare, four long years to prepare. So just because it was the end of the war, and they'd hoped for the end of the war didn't mean that they stopped fighting. They continued to fight. By the 11th, they would be going down across the valley to the east of uh, Ville devant Chaumont, and uh, it is there that the armistice was declared, but as they were moving into action on that day. ended and the soldiers were coming home company M was coming home Paul's father and brother and sister went to the train to meet it and stood there and watched as all the soldiers came off and were greeted with loving arms and celebrations that they were home and the train emptied and Paul was not among them. They had no idea where Paul was. Paul, at that point, had just recently been promoted to sergeant and led his squad out of the trenches into no man's land and apparently came under heavy fire and took shelter in a bomb crater. And Paul made the decision to have his men return to the trenches while he stayed to give cover to them. And I don't know who it was, but one of his soldiers decided to stay with him. And all the others made it back to the trenches safely. But when the firing ended and they were able to go out in no man's land, they found Paul and the soldier 
dead together in that crater. What those men experienced, to think that you're looking over a beautiful flat field or a, a small valley, but to think on the other side, 500 yards or, or 700 yards on the other side might have been a machine gun or a series of machine guns that when you move down into that valley, you'd lose your life. For me, it puts it into perspective what these young men went through. Who are they as Americans? Or who are they as to what field of battle did they die in? And it's the human aspect that certainly brings the importance of the battle to light, but it also brings another aspect, and that's the individual perspective, the individual families, like Lisa Ann's family. How did the loss of her uncle Paul, how did that affect the family and, and what is she attempting to discover when she looks for his, his heritage, his, the family roots? When Look Magazine came out in 1964, it was the 50th anniversary of the start of World War I. I was three years old and my grandmother showed it to me, and inside was a picture of Paul's gravestone saying that for some, the last day of the war was the last day of life. And I was only three, but I clearly remember my grandmother emotional and saying, you know, this was my cousin Paul. He was like a brother to me. And he went to war and we never saw him again, and he's buried in France. I feel such a bond with Paul. I mean, three years old, I was wondering about him after looking at the Look magazine. I appreciate so much what he did for this country and what he went through. And to me, it's an honor to be trying to find out everything I can about him. On November 11th, 2011, there had been an article in a Connecticut newspaper talking about a Rick Maynard who had found 50 letters from his great uncle Paul from World War I. And I actually sat there for a few seconds saying, it's a coincidence. This can't be the same Paul Maynard. This can't be in a relation. And then reading the article and seeing a picture of one of the letters and instantly recognizing Paul's handwriting. We've only seen each other once and that was just two days after we found each other. But it was obvious that there's a bond between us and that bond is Paul. I was able to find out so much more about Paul, who he was, what he did during the war from those letters, just from the summaries I have from Rick. Paul liked the simple things in life. He grew up in an area well, there was mostly sawmills, but everybody in the community also had their own gardening and farming. Nothing large, but it was their way of life. That's how they provided for themselves. And Paul wanted to do that for himself when he returned from the war. The fact that Paul, Paul is where and the type of land where he envisioned himself spending his life. You really couldn't ask for more than that. It would be wonderful to have Paul at Arlington. I could see him every week. I could spend so much time with him, but he wasn't a city boy. He was a country boy. He wanted to be a farmer. And, you know, he's, he's where 
the fields and the crops are now. And it's a good feeling that he's there. Every individual headstone, it's an individual story. It's someone like Paul Maynard. It's someone that's connected to Lisa Ann. And we have 14,000 of those stories out there. Those headstones can't talk. So we need to say something for them. I feel a responsibility to tell their stories, those guys out there. Not only their stories, but their family stories. And not only those family stories, but the American story. That's how we transmit their history. That's how we transmit us as Americans, because their story is our story. And we need to know that. I don't think I'm ever going to stop digging into Paul Maynard and everything about him. I, I think there's always something more to learn as you go along. Something leads to something else, and the story never gets old. Paul only lived 21 years, but he did a lot in that 21 years, and I think it's worth telling his story. It should never be forgotten. More than two million Americans, like Paul Maynard, served in Europe during World War I, and nearly 100,000 never returned home. Created in 1923, after World War I, the American Battle Monuments Commission cares for the cemeteries where these men and women are buried, and ensures their sacrifice and memory is never forgotten. It's through stories like Paul Maynard's that ABMC fulfills its promise that time will not dim the glory of their deeds. Visit www.abmc.gov to learn more about the American Battle Monuments Commission.